folks, welcome back to another episode of The Retail Perch. Uh, looks like we're slowing down our pace here, Gary, as we get to number 100 here. And <laughs> summer is getting over. We're all been busy. Um, good, good, good. good things take time, right? Yes, yes. But, you know, as, as always, we have an amazing lineup of people coming on the show. But Gary and I have been traveling a bit. I know we've been to a number of shows. We just got back from Grocery Shop in Las Vegas. Gary, a great show. Yes, yeah, it was a busy few days. Um, you know, I, I know you guys certainly looked like you were busy at the uh, bird's eye booth, and uh, uh, I just seemed like I was going from one one meeting or conversation to another. I know, I know. I guess Gary's knee was really being tested there. Uh, knee, <laughs> hip, whatever, right? all those joints. So uh, I survived. Okay, yes, you did. Yes, you did. But yeah, great show. I think it was it was terrific. I think it's terrific to see all the buzz that's going on out there. Obviously. AI, generative AI, chat GPT, meta AI, you know, all the AIs that are coming out of the woodwork, you know, pretty exciting. Uh, but today, we happen to have uh, somebody who's very familiar with our space, you know, first party data, familiar with the retail, understanding how to deliver promotions one to one, and helping CPGs reach out to them. But um, I want to let Tom Bird just give his own introduction, but among other things, he also has done over 50,000 miles of sailboat, sailboating, uh, lived in remote areas of the world, thousands of miles away from mankind, and uh, does some really cool things. So uh, but we're going to talk to him about, you know, payments, media networks, among other things. But Tom, welcome to the Retail Perch. Yeah, thanks so much. I, I appreciate it, you guys. It's nice to be here with you. And uh, yeah, it's funny you mentioned the sailboat uh, sailing stuff. Every chance we get, we um, we do go offshore on a sailboat, and um, and it's nice to go from like a trade show, like you're just talking about, um, grocery shop and or whatever one you might be going at to at, to then escape and sit on the deck of a boat, hang anchored off a, a remote island. It's a very nice way to to cool back down, man. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and your cell right. phones don't work, and you know. Yeah, sorry, that's, right. that's right. Well, now, now we've got uh, um, Elon Musk coming Starlink. in with Starlink, <laughs> and Starlink changed the whole game, right? So um, now you can be out in the middle of the Pacific Ocean, thousands of miles from anywhere, and have high-speed internet. So it, it becomes a um, you know a, 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 a role of self-control to try to keep yourself <laughs> offline. No. <laughs> There you go. There you go. I, I see that. Terrific. So, Tom, maybe we can get to get this started. Give us a quick uh, uh, your background. You know, how did you wind up where you are, your journey? And uh, I, I see that you founded four companies, had some successful exits. So I think, sure, it's going to be a terrific story for us to just kind of set the stage so we can continue the conversation. Yeah, sure. I mean, I, I won't go too far back, but yeah, I'm a, I'm a serial entrepreneur for what it's worth. Uh, over 20, I won't, I will date myself. It's like 28 years now, um, uh, focused on launching companies from scratch. So coming up with ideas, what I always kind of say, coming up with an idea on a napkin at a dinner somewhere and turning that into a company with a, uh, with a value that could be acquired by a larger company later. That's typically the path. I've focused on the categories of advertising, data, loyalty, and I've had the opportunity to work with some amazing people over those years. Um, I, we've been the pioneers and have many patents that we've been able to um, draft and get to issued in these categories. Um, and I think the most, the, the way to summarize our focus and my focus over those years in those four companies has been, we identify audiences, that means advertising audiences, in places where they maybe weren't recognized before. Um, so spent some years building out advertising networks on uh, on mobile networks, as in mobile phones. Uh, we were the first, uh, my team was the first in a company called Third Screen Media where we launched ads on Verizon Wireless. Um, that, that became what it is today, one of the largest advertising channels in the world. And we are very fortunate to, have a, to be um, actually kind of uh, criticized initially, uh, you're going to put ads on mobile phones. And I still walk into places and people say, you're that guy, you're that guy. So I get that a lot. Um, uh. But, you know, it's it, it, it obviously was a lot of fun to do that. And then um, changed, uh, took that same method or same theory 
and uh, uh, applied it to um, what is now today payments data. And um, so maybe we talk a little bit today, I figured about that journey that I've gone through, which was working with um, networks, publishers, what I would call publishers um, that have eyeballs and can place ads, incentives, loyalty programs in front of those eyeballs and leverage the data so that it's relevant ads, incentives, and loyalty programs that those consumers see, right? And um, I think that that summarizes my background. It's been a hell of a run, and it really has been. And, um, and I've, I've found myself right now, and I'll wrap up here, but I found myself at this amazing point in time of the everybody saw the death of the cookie as like wow watch out digital advertising is gonna die you know and then the sudden turn of those that are very good at identifying chaos as an opportunity and the growth of first party data and now the growth of things around payments data which includes payments data by through retailers, payments data through banks, payments data through anybody that sells anything, and the incredible value. So uh, I find myself right at the at the crux of this amazing point in time. And by hook or by crook, I I ended up here. <laughs> and I, I I wish I could say that 25 years ago I knew that this was where it was all going, and you could skate to where the puck was going to be, but. It wasn't. I just happened to be in the right place at the right time. So it's it's great to be with you guys who are also players right in this space. Yeah, yeah. So, Tom, if you would, I could be interesting if you could maybe just peel the layers back a little bit around payments data and, um, you know, speak to what types of data you uh, are able to gain access to through partnering with banks, et cetera, and then how you bring that together with other data sets like a retailer's data. Sure. I I think I would be um, remiss in just saying, you know, it's all born. Access to this, this data is what is new. This data has obviously been around for a long time, right? Access to this data is what's new. And, and, the you know back in 2018 GDPR the General Data Protection uh, Rules I think a regulation um, came out in Europe um, a couple of years later California um, yeah. following that all driven by consumers saying hey you've got my data and you're using it in crazy ways so going like you said Gary putting this data together what was happening is all these third parties were collecting data and the consumer almost kind of had no say in it and right. that was the pushback. So now you have CCPA here and the California Consumer um, Protection Act is the first real one. There's a couple other states that are coming up, but that drove people like Google and other massive publishers that were using all this third-party data to enact the death of the cookie and say, we're no longer gonna use third-party data, only first-party data. And they did it really, behind the guys, let's be real, right? They, they kind of came out and said, we're going to do this um, because we're behind protecting the consumer's uh, data and, you know, consumer privacy. Yeah, you know, it's because Google actually has a lot of data and they said only first party data. So, you know, you got you to take it with a, a touch of salt here. But the reality is that it caused, I think, a um, this opportunity for payments data to suddenly be introduced to the market as so valuable. And it unlocked the folks that were holding on to it so tight. 10 years ago, if you don't mind that I just ramble for a second here, but- Go right ahead. No, no, it's, it's super interesting. So 10 years ago, I was banging on the doors of the, of the large banks in the US market and the European market. And I was saying, hey, you guys have this, this audience that has, as I mentioned, my history is kind of recognizing new audience. I said, you guys have, this audience and my my kind of fun opening statement is, hi, Mr. Bank of America, uh, Mrs. Bank of America, Mrs. Chase, um, uh, you know, congratulations on building an amazing media company. And they look at you like you're out of your mind, right? And you say, but wait, let's look at what that means. You've got people looking at their phone and, and a three to four times a week, sometimes multiple times a day going into that bank's app or you can do the same thing with retailers, going into the retailer's app, going into the retailer's webpage and sharing 
their data, sharing their eyeballs, giving all this opportunity. And you and my time was with the banks. I was saying, and you're not leveraging that to your advantage and to the consumer's advantage. Give the consumer something back for this. And so at that time, the banks were like, you're out of your mind. We're not giving up any of that data. You know, and the retailers were in the same boat. They were like, you're not, you're crazy. We're not going to give you access to this data. And then when GDPR and CCPA and all this cookie dying, it opened doors. And now we have this opportunity to take those data pockets or those data lakes and merge them together in things considered clean rooms, right? So it protects the data. The consumer has opted in in some fashion to quid pro quo kind of fashion. Sure, yeah. I'll let you use my data in a certain way so long as I get something back for it, which usually comes in the form of, of a currency, whether it's points or it's cash back or something like that. But it gives the consumer something back. And therefore, there's this built-in. So is the opt-in happening on the banking side or the retail side? Both, all right? Yeah. So when you talk about this payments data, so you've, we've got it identified, it's on the banks and it's at the retailers. And, and in order to merge it together, because if you look at a bank, they know where you shop, but they don't know what you buy. A retailer knows what you buy, but they don't know any place else that you shopped. Right. So it just makes sense that these two data points can come together so yeah. long as the consumers opted in, like you just said, Shaka. So, you know, the, the, the consumers opting in on the retailer's app and opting in, of course, on the bank's app um, or web pages. I'll use app as a general statement. And then that consumer in merging these data points is receiving back the highest amount of value. In the industry of retail media networks, um, we see growth from the different players. And I mean, you've got everything from, if you just look at the networks themselves, Dollar General Media Network, Kroger's Precision Marketing, Walmart Connect, Albertsons Collective, all of these, CBS, you can't ignore that. Um, all of these programs that were loyalty programs initially have now become unbelievable advertising networks. Yeah. And the consumer's winning. Consumer's getting discounts. How many times have we all walked into a CBS and you say, hey, here's my phone number. I'm like waiting to give them my phone number because I want all the discounts I'm going to get, right? Amazing programs. So I, I totally appreciate the quid pro quo. Uh, and I think everybody else does. It's proven, right? And so the... The growth of retail media networks, what are we at now? It's, you know, this year, I think the argument or the the projections are that it's going to be somewhere in the $127 billion or $125 billion in 2023. It's going to surpass TV um, advertising spend, right? So it's proven out and it's grown very quickly. That is a sign that first party data is super valuable for two things. When you merge the two pieces together, the bank's data coming in, and we can go into how that happens, I'm happy to, one. But when you merge those two things together, you're, you're, char you're, you're solving two different pieces. Um, you're, you're first solving how to put the right ad or targeting, how to use that data to put the right offer in front of the consumer at the right time, because you're taking that data in its history. And we're looking at the history of that consumer they become a cohort, as it's as it's called, or a profile, and then they are presented offers that are meaningful. I, at my age, my lifestyle, am not interested in Pampers ads, okay? But if you show me uh, offers on hiking shoes, or you show me offers on healthy food, I'm your guy, right? That's That actually means something to me. So that's the whole idea of taking shopper history and using it for targeting. The other side of this data is for attribution. In advertising pre now, <laughs> um, you, you had that missing element of saying an ad actually drove a consumer to make a purchase. So ads in digital world, right. especially, yeah. were all about click-through, right? Okay, right. they saw the ad, so you had impression rates and you had click-through rates. And that kind of drove the world, right? Everybody was like, oh, I got a 1% click-through rate, a 10% click-through rate. Great. But what was missing was, did you know, did Gary actually go to the darn store and make a purchase? Did make a purchase, yeah. You know? And how much did he spend, by the way? Did it? Did he increase his spend? 
It increases frequency. None of that was, was available. Well, that's what's available now because the bank can say, we use that historic data to put the right offer in front of the person. And the bank can then say, we made that person, we, we shifted the share of wallet, as they would say, right? They moved the person from maybe one retailer to another. Or a retailer can say, we put that consumer based on their purchase history in a category, we put offers in front of them, and we shifted their maybe choice of product, choice of category. And they will show then that they bought that product at a different price point. Maybe they bought more of that product. They were repeat buyers. Um, and, and, and this is attribution. That attribution piece, I think, isn't talked about a whole lot because it's, um, it's just kind of so new. And candidly, a lot of those traditional parties, those traditional publishers that had the eyeballs, guess what? They still don't have access to that data. Right, of course. Right? The retailers do. Yeah, the retailers yeah. do. The banks do. So, so, so uh, just a quick internet. So, if I were to summarize, essentially, what you're saying is you're bringing together bank data where you know where the money's been spent, and retailer data where you know what the money's being spent on together, and with an opt-in from the shopper, be able to do smarter targeting that's delivered back to the shopper. And uh, so, the clarification here I want is. The presentation medium is the bank's digital platform or the retailers or either? What's yeah, so cool question, actually. This is, and, and I'd say uh, herein lies the chaos and the opportunity, right? So you, um, the retailers quickly realized with the launch of all these retail media networks, and by the way, a whole picks and shovels industry, all the people that support that, right? Amazing category to be in right now. Um, that launch was so aggressive that the retailers suddenly said, I don't have enough eyeballs. I can't even support it all. Like the, the, the desire from the brands to get in front of this audience with this targeting and attribution that we just talked about is, is great, right? It's really proving my return on ad spend or ROAS as people call it, right? There it's really, I can finally know where my dollars are being affected. Well, what happened was they, they ran out of eyeballs. So at the same time, the banks, these two categories were growing. At the same time, they were both growing bank audiences and retail audiences, but they weren't merging. And the banks were having the same effect. They were starting to realize, holy cow, wait a minute. They were behind on the retailers as far as recognizing their media value. Okay, They didn't understand the opportunity that they had. Um, and front, it was kind of like going back for a moment to the days when I walked into the wireless operators and I said, look at all the people staring at their phones. You should put ads in front of them. They thought I was crazy. I had people kick me out of their offices. It's a funny story about getting kicked out of AT&T one time because I was like, you're an advertising network. They're like, get this guy out of here. He's insane. Well, now they now it's a massive business for them, right? But the banks were kind of more like that. They were like, we're not advertising. We got to be careful here. Retailers were like, we're advertising. That's all we ever do. That's their whole world, right? That's just been on shelf. Now they're shifting it over digital. So the the idea that there was suddenly a opportunity going back to your question that, you know, how do we merge these two? Or where is it? It's on both, right? So the retailers have maxed out a lot of their audience and they're now looking for third party audiences to bring their data into. The banks are sitting there with this audience that hasn't been fully optimized. It's getting close now. Um, and it hasn't been optimized in the sense that there are, I mean, in our particular effort right now, we're launching with uh, two banks. We've got a, a total of about 70 million consumers. And we only, and we're doing that where the banks are pulling us in because the banks want everyday purchase offers. They want the consumer to see offers from the grocery chains, from the from the pharmacies, from the uh, convenience store chains, and they want those to be brand um, funded, right? So there's this immediate, there's actual intersection happening as we speak where the retail media networks and the payments media networks are realizing their, their joint opportunity. And some of it is displayed in the bank. Uh, so the consumer seeing offers 
launching literally in November. Probably about the time that, that this session will be aired, there will be live offers from CPGs in Bank of America's mobile application. I can mm. say that because I think by the time this airs, we'll be okay to say it. But the, um, the Bank of America will be one of the first banks to ever introduce this, right? And it's really cool that a consumer will be able to go into their bank app and pick offers for items, specific products at major grocery stores um, that they can just go into that store, use their payment card and get discounts. Um, so when and, the shopper or when the consumer sees that offer in their Bank of America app, that offer is only good at a specific retailer? Uh, that's another great question, Gary. So no, it can it, it's up to the advertiser. So it's up to the brand. Hey, I want to use my shopper dollars and drive people into Kroger. Great. Then we'll make it so that that offer is only available at Kroger. Or somebody comes in, that same brand could be and say, well, I've also got national dollars. I want this to be available at any retailer. Okay. And so they can have a choice. All right. And then that offer, that discount, 50 cents, whatever that electronic coupon is, is linked to the payment card. So when the shopper shops, checks out, uses their Bank of America card, it triggers the savings. That's right. And there will be, because straight up, transparently, that's freaking hard to do, right? <laughs> to right. That's why I'm <laughs> <laughs> so there will be um there will be specific retailers. It's going to be about 30 retailers where what you just described is is active. There will be almost never the opportunity to do that type of technical connection on the back end for the corner store bodega right. on Broadway yeah. and 43rd, right? Yeah. You know, that ain't gonna because happen. It's kind of not gonna, you're not gonna get the transactions back to be able to match up to do the, to the, do the stuff, right? So, so in, in tradition, or I should say in um, leveraging all the technology that's available to us and has been around forever, things such as um, scanning a barcode or taking a picture of a receipt, these things will be available so that the national brand dollars can be spent. As yeah. we all know, there's restrictions. You can't spend national dollars unless it can be used at any retailer that carries your product. So we have to bring, so we will deploy, we are deploying those capabilities. So there will be the linked to the payment card, as you described, Gary, and there will be, you can also get this at the corner store um, by taking a picture of the receipt. The, all of that will be encompassed so that the consumer is not, no consumer is left out. Yeah. Very it's, cool. It's, Very it's, cool. it's a, it's a cool thing. It, 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 it's really fun because. What, what kind of delay do you see between the offer being redeemed and the discount showing up for the customer in their banking app? So um, depending on the, on the redemption method, like we just described, card linked, barcode, receipt, picture. Those are actually the three that we'll deploy. Um, a, a card linked will be immediate uh, recognition. So the consumer will use their card, walk out the door and be told, thank you for your redemption. So there'll be immediate recognition. Um, the settlement back to the consumer's, um, what was statement credit is what it's called. Um, could happen based on the bank. It could be as much as uh, 30 days. It could be as short as a couple of days. All right, it's kind of some retailers, some brands want the return period to pass. Yeah. So they, you know, but if you're talking grocery, then it can happen much quicker. Yeah. Um, but if you're talking about a barcode, it can be a reduction in real time right at the point of sale. So the right. consumer can show a barcode and it'll discount right there, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, and then uh, receipt capture is uh, is about the same as the card linked. It could be as much as 30 days. It could be uh, two days. Got it. Yeah. yeah. Very cool. Very yeah. cool. I think the interesting thing I find here is that typically, I mean, you know, we've executed this and, you know, uh, we do this at Bird's Eye where we deliver personalized promotions and savings to shoppers at a specific retailer. I think what's really cool here is you're able to tap into the universe of locations that a shopper could potentially use that payment card at. 
Right. And so you could get a broad range of offers from something from, you know, like you said, hiking shoes to, you know, you, your favorite uh, perfume to whatever. Right. So I think that's, that's really cool. Yeah. yeah. yeah I, I, go ahead, Gary. The, the, the other thing I'd add to that shaker is that, you know, from a brand perspective, there's beginning to be some uh, pushback, if you will, from the big brands around having to effectively pay multiple times to reach that same consumer, right? I got to pay Walmart, I got to pay Kroger, I got to pay Albertsons, CBS, whoever, right? And I wind up talking to the same shopper. It sounds like what Tom's doing can help leverage a lot of data to create targeted audiences, et cetera, but it's a mechanism for the brand to go to that consumer and pay once, not multiple times. Yeah. And Gary, you bring up an interesting point that, um, you know, when you, when you launch a product like this from a napkin up and you get it out the door like this, it took us about two years to get this one to the point where it's at now. Um, we didn't think about this particular thing where a brands, the brands have come back to us and said, you know, I spend a lot of money on some really good partners like Ibotta and Fetch, right? Mm -hmm. That's typically the two names we hear. Um, but those people are the deal seekers. Right. And uh, and sometimes the brands will say, we've actually started focusing on just one or the other partner because they're both deal seekers. And if they've got one app, they probably have the other one. Right. Um, our audience is a common shopper audience. It's not specifically that deal seeker because those consumers aren't installing the bank app to find right. offers, right? They're not, they're not, um, uh, they're more of the regular shopper who is active in this app for other reasons, mostly from the bank's perspective, it's a customer support vehicle. Right. And if they can build in incentives, much driven, much more driven from a loyalty perspective initially, then they're opening up the door to get to consumers and the CPGs or the retailers are benefiting from reaching a newer audience, a different audience right. that they may right. not be able to reach through other channels. So it's, yeah. it is unique and it is a uh, very targeted. Yeah, that's a really good point you bring up because, you know, Again, I, I don't have the data in front of me to, to make a qualified comment, but it seems like if you're reaching deal seekers, you're not necessarily building basket for the retailer, right? Yep. Or loyalty. You're basically driving some discount dollars into the store, and that's about it. You're not really getting any incrementality out of it in terms of overall spend potentially, right? Yeah. Uh, no, this is, this is like super interesting because I think uh, it opens up a different uh universe uh for a much more broader so i think traditionally you know shoppers have had to seek um uh, deals or discounts or incentives retailer by retailer right you know I, I get i get the i get the home depot flyer and i get my local grocery store flyer and i get my ace hardware flyer you know and they've all been kind of separate and we're talking about how do we look at that shopper across their retail journey, and then give them something meaningful across the base. And I, I think that's it's 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 a ambitious, brave, and you know exciting yeah. attempt. <laughs> yeah. So I often use the term um, "dead cat bounce." When you're an inventor, <laughs> you tend to bring things to market, and you've done it, it. It. Yeah. No matter how much data you collect on your way to market, you right. still kind of feel like you've done it in a vacuum, right? And right. then when you launch it. You wait to see if if it's gonna if as using another term here, but you know, will the dogs actually eat the dog food, right? Right. Yeah. And so yeah. the fortunate thing this time around is for me and my team is that we see the growth of retail media, we see the growth of payments media, and we're really the agent that's bringing the two together, and uh, we're introducing some cool new things that haven't been done before. But there's a lot of proof points here, yeah. and 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 the fact that we'll have that uh, opportunity to reach new consumers uh, that maybe aren't reachable through other channels and that the market has come alive, that of the first party data providers have come alive 
and right. said, we figured out a way to use this data and use our assets in a way that's good for a consumer. I don't care who you are, by the way, you're going to find somebody that's going to say, oh, bad, bad, you know, yeah, use yeah, data. Of course. Of course. They're always out there. Yeah, yeah, of course. Well, but then, a couple more questions. How how frequently is your data refreshed, both from the bank side and the retail side? On the bank side, it's 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 um, near real time. It's daily. Um, okay. And on the retail side, because we're it, it's more on a um, poll basis than a refresh basis. Because on the retail side, we are mostly pulling data when a consumer redeems, right? So in other right. words, on our world, in our world, the bank is the publisher, the consumer sees the offers. We are targeting based on all the data we can get, all the historic data we can get. Um, we don't know any PII, by the way, and we don't know any PCI, payment card um, information, right? We don't know any of that. We just have an ID, typical world of advertising. Yep. Yeah. And we uh, therefore put the ad in front of the consumer. So we're using that data from the two-part data story that I told a moment ago. We're using targeting as much and refreshed as we can get it. Um, and, and and then on the retail side, we pull every time that consumer redeems. In okay. some cases, at some retailers, we see all of the baskets. So you not only see what they offer, or what the offer was that they redeemed, but you see what else was in their basket. Yeah. Um, that then helps you build, you can't use it to, you know, you got to be really careful what you do with that data. Um, you can use it for the specific purposes of these programs only, of course. Yeah. Um, but uh, you are able to then refresh your data on an ongoing basis as the users redeem. Did I answer your question yeah, right? Yeah, no, that, that's, that's helpful. Thank you. Uh, and, and then the other question I had was, you know, can so the offers are showing up in the bank app, for example. Is there any opportunity to take that ad out via, you know, programmatic and have it appear elsewhere? <laughs> so this is V2. You just mentioned V2, right? So V1 uh -huh. is right. we're going to launch this audience and we get that question. Your question is spot on. Um, and that is. I would say, as I mentioned before, the retailers are already there. They're into putting their data out into the programmatic. They're hanging a shingle in the programmatic yeah. universe, right? Um, the banks are uh, are behind the curve, uh, but very aware of that opportunity. So we end up in a very interesting position. SNP does our company because we're um, helping the banks uh, and our publishers realize how to do that, right? That today, if you bring this kind of thing, and, and here's one little thing, it's also a personnel thing. At the retail media networks, Albertsons Collective, um, you know, the Kroger Precision yeah. Marketing, these guys, they've gone out and hired people from the digital media space. They yeah. know, so you, the banks, and you mentioned Cardlytics, I think, Shaker earlier, yeah. Um, uh, they have gone out and hired people from the digital, but the banks themselves are just doing that right now. Yeah. Um, yeah. And they're, so, so the, it's coming. The, yeah. So where it evolves to are really bank or financial media networks. That's right. That's, that's what they call the payments media network. So the, yeah. the banks are basically, um, realizing that we're a bank, we're a payment media network because we have payment data to bring to the table. Yeah. Yes. Got it. Cool. Now, this has been super interesting, Tom. And I think it is obviously right up our alley. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah, yeah. You guys yeah. are fun to talk to because you know you have the good questions. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's terrific. But, but Tom, so tell us a little bit about your the other side of Tom. So this adventurer, Tom. <laughs> yeah, yeah, sure. We'll just spend a minute on that. So um, one of the things that I benefit from as an entrepreneur is that uh, you know, you get some time off because when people do buy your companies, they don't want you anymore, right? right. Thanks for building this, Tom. Go away now. <laughs> and so, and by the way, at that point in time, uh, you're pretty burnt out. You know, you've done a hard slog for, right. you know, five to 10 years of building these things and um, and you, you need some time off. So our time off uh, that we do is sail and we sail long distance. So we um, we've sailed most of the way around the world on a couple a couple different trips. 
Um, the first time we did it with our kids when they were one and three. Wow. Um, we then did it again when they were uh, between so five and So it was just the four of you on the boat? Or? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, my God. Yeah, just the four of us. And we left Newport, Rhode Island and went down to South America and all around the Caribbean and did that trip. That was one time when the kids were really tiny. Um, we then did it again and, and uh, sailed across the Pacific Ocean. So left Newport, Rhode Island again, went down, went through the Panama Canal, sailed the South Pacific, um, did an amazing two years of being off the grid, literally hiking, you know, uh, mountains in remote places. Uh, and, and, and now, uh, it, because of Starlink and other internet connectivity things, we have the good fortune of being empty nesters, my wife and I, and, uh, we spend half the year down in the Caribbean on a boat. So it's, it's, it's become our, it is our lifestyle, but, um, yeah, it's fun. I, I mean, I, nice. it, it, it's, it's the way it's my health, you know, it's my, uh, yeah. my therapy, I guess. is the Yeah. Yeah. No, that's, yeah, that's, yeah, absolutely. You earned it. So, I mean, yeah, that's, that's fantastic. That's, that's so great to hear. Yeah, so, hey, listen, it. again, it's been, it's been fantastic having you, uh, on the show. We should definitely connect outside of it. It seems like what you're doing is super interesting and might be intersecting with some of the stuff that we're into. Uh, but uh, Gary, anything before we close out? No, this has been a really great conversation, uh, Tom. Yeah, so, uh, it, you know, I think it'll be of, of great interest, certainly to our audience, uh, but but the industry. Yeah, um, yeah you know, I, I've known for a long time, just through my work, that uh, the the banks have long been interested in moving in this direction, and you know, as you called out, it's finally happening. It's finally happening. You actually have people supporting it inside you have champions inside the banks yeah. now nice nice yeah oh it's no, a pretty cool great. time fantastic that's so, good it's been great talking with you guys by the yeah, way yeah all the very Thanks best to snip me. and we'll we'll oh, let's we'll connect in touch and if you give us your uh address we'll mail you one of these oh right. perfect oh great great, great. Yeah, the you know, so I'll have the a... south pacific shaker exactly exactly <laughs> send us a picture from <laughs> drone, drone delivery to the boat now he, he's there you go. next to a galapagos tortoise and <laughs> sipping coffee in the morning and said, I'll get that picture sure so you guys can post it. There Mr. Darwin was correct. So <laughs> yeah. Anyway, really cool. Great having you, Tom. Thanks again. And all right, uh, thanks, Jacob, great Jerry. Show. It's been great, man. Thank Take you. care. All right. Bye guys. Bye. Make sure to join us every Monday and connect with us at the retail perch on Instagram and Facebook. And if you have any questions, feel free to email us at the retail perch at birdseye.com. Until next time, this is Shaker. And this is Gary, signing off.